Society. Last week, we began looking at a stretch of four chapters in 1 Samuel, and it began with uh, chapter 4. And it was teaching the church of God about her true help, that is, the stone of her help. And the stone of our help is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the help of the believer. He is the help of the sinner. He's the help of those who have no righteousness of their own. And he's referred to here in Scripture as Ebenezer, our Ebenezer. And so when we were looking last Sunday at the fourth chapter, it concluded with something that seemed like quite a terrible disaster. And it was. It was a, it was a disaster what happened to Israel because they lost a great many souls. The, the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain with the sword in battle. Eli died. Phinehas' wife died. And worst of all for the people of Israel was that the Ark of the Covenant was taken by their enemies. And what happened was this was a very fleshly move by Israel. They had been defeated the day before, and they thought, well, let's bring the Ark of the Covenant into the camp. And surely this will be a blessing for us, and this will gain us the victory over our enemies. But ultimately, what they did was called Ichabod by the widow of Phineas. Ichabod, because, she said, the glory is departed from Israel, for the Ark of God is taken. And what was so terrifying about this for, for this woman and what was so frightening for Israel is what the Ark of the Covenant stands for. That is, the Ark represents the presence of God among his people. The Ark had many beautiful pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ in, in it, and it represents God's presence. This is our fellowship with God is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they were broken over the fact that the covenant was taken from them and brought into the camp of their enemies who hated them. And they thought all is lost. Now, turn over to Exodus chapter 33. Let me just show you two verses about the presence of God contained here in the ark, what, what this signifies. So this is Exodus 33, this is verses 18 and 19, and remember the Ichabod's wife said the glory is departed. Now this is Moses here in Exodus 33, and he's asked the Lord, Lord go with us. If you don't go up with us, don't, don't bring us up into this land of promise. And Moses asked the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, in verse 18, show me thy glory. And here's what the Lord said in response to that. He said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And so what the Lord is teaching us here is that it's the glory of God to show mercy and compassion and grace upon whom he will be merciful and compassionate and gracious. That's God's glory. That's God's glory to save whom he will, to reveal himself to whomsoever he will. To, to whomsoever he wills to be gracious and merciful to. And so this truth of the Lord, that God is gracious, to whom God will be gracious, runs contrary to the idolatry of man. That's not something you hear men speak of. And, and to this day, it's still 
boasted of and gloried in by man that man has a free will and he has a choice and he has to choose whether to let God save him or not. And it's idolatry. It's a lie. That's not true at all. That's not what the scriptures say. In fact, the scriptures show that when man is left to himself, he chooses to do evil. As Stephen said to the Jews, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, you stiff-necked people. That's, that's what we are. We are stiff-necked people, hard-hearted, who oppose God and oppose his Christ and oppose the gospel, except God be gracious to us and break our hard hearts and deliver us from the darkness and filth and evil of idolatry. That's what we are by nature. And that's what we need is salvation by almighty God, almighty sovereign God. Otherwise, we die in our sins. We die in our sins. And so it is God's glory to save whom he will. Because God isn't powerless. God isn't dependent on man. God saves whom he will. And thank God that he does. Because otherwise we'd all go to hell in our own sin. That God that, that waits on man is an idle God. Our Lord does not wait for man to decide whether he wants God to save him or not. God's glory is that he saves whom he will. And he overcomes our foolish, stubborn will. He overcomes it. So our God, the scriptures teach our God, chose a people in Christ before the foundation of the world, before we did any good or evil, so that man cannot boast that it's of his works. It's of God's choosing. It's of God's choosing. So then, Paul, writing, quoting from that very passage in Exodus 33, 19, what he said to Moses, that he will be, be merciful to whom he will be merciful, and compassionate to whom he will be compassionate. He concluded this, Romans 9, 16, so then it's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. So that's the glory we're talking about. God, have you left us? God, have you abandoned us? God, have you forsaken us and turned from us? That we no longer have that fellowship with the presence of our God? And so they were, they were terrified. They were terrified. They were afraid. So everything about the salvation of the people of God, it showcases and speaks to the sovereignty of our God. And as we saw in the last chapter, what Israel failed to do by all her efforts, all her strength, all her wisdom, everything that she thought she was going to accomplish, what she failed to do, the Lord did triumphantly. And that's what we see in this next chapter, the Lord doing triumphantly, going face to face, toe to toe with idolatry and destroying it and overcoming the idolatry of man. So, but before we look at this lesson of chapter five, I just want to pick up something that we were closing with in the last message from chapter 4 that we saw there. I want to look at that gospel that our Lord accomplished for his people through his blood redemption on the cross. Because there's a picture seen here that when the ark was taken away and all seemed like it was lost, we see the picture of Christ in that. Because on the night in which our Lord was betrayed, he was led away willingly by his enemies who took him into mock trials and ultimately condemned to be crucified on the cross, which our Lord willingly went to. that He might be the fit sacrifice of his people on that cross. You see, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Salvation is the Lord's work, not the work of man. And it's not by the cooperation of man. It's our God's work for his people. Our Lord said in Isaiah 63, 5, he said, I looked and there was none to help. And I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore, mine own arm brought salvation unto me. In my fury, it upheld me. And so our Lord willingly 
was taken by the enemies. He went with the enemies in order to accomplish a triumphant, glorious redemption for his people. He hung on the cross alone as the sacrifice of his people, as the surety of his people, and satisfied the justice of holy God. So that God is well pleased with us in his son. And then it happened that for three days and three nights, he lay in the grave and his disciples were broken, afraid, trembling, not understanding what was going on. They said, we thought that it was him who should redeem Israel. We thought he was the Messiah. And they were right. <laughs> they were right. They just didn't understand it yet. He hadn't risen from the grave and showed himself to them. At the, this time, when they said that, he had showed them himself, but they didn't know who he was yet. And so the glory, they thought, was departed from Israel, for their mercy seat was taken from them. Their mercy seat was taken from them. And, and Paul tells us, he speaks of the, the the great triumph of our Savior. He speaks of it in Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15. When our Lord was on the cross, Paul points out to us, he says, he was blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. He had to go to the cross because the law opposed us. And we, we had a debt to the law in Adam. We had a debt to God for perfect righteousness in Adam. And we could not satisfy that debt. So Christ came and he paid the debt for his people. And he removed that law so the law has nothing more to say to you. And you stand complete in the Lord Jesus Christ. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That is, he made a public spectacle of his enemies. He shamed them. He despised the shame of the cross, and he shamed his enemies. So that we stand triumphant in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so these, these enemies, these Philistines, taking away the Ark of the Covenant and bringing it into Ashkelon, as we'll see, our God laughs from heaven. He laughs at them. Just as our God laughed from heaven and his Christ laughed because they knew that, that in, in what they were doing, thinking that they had defeated God's, God's Messiah, that they had defeated God, that they had killed the, the son, and the heir, and taken the inheritance, God knew, you haven't done any, any such thing. I've accomplished my redemption for my people in this. And you're, the evil in your heart has only, I've only used it to bring it to pass for my glory, for my glory and your shame. And so the Lord has, has blessed his people richly in the Lord Jesus Christ. He rose from the dead and he accomplished everything he came to do. And so we're no longer, that's how we, we overcome the oppression of our oppressors. And as we saw Israel trying to throw off their oppressors last week and trying to go to religion to throw off their oppressors last week and God would not allow, it, allow them success in that. Our God doesn't allow us success in saving ourselves or using religion in a form of religion to, to bless ourselves. It's not going to happen. Christ is our blessing. Christ is our triumphant Savior. Christ is all for his people. So the, of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that according as it's written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. And so, as we'll see in all these chapters, Christ is our Ebenezer. Christ is the stone of our help. He's the stone that the builders rejected but the same is made the head of the corner by our God. It's the Lord's doing and it's glorious in our eyes because God has powerfully, triumphantly worked this in our hearts. He's given us faith and life and hope in the Lord Jesus Christ to believe him, to trust him, and to wait upon him. Now, as we come into chapter 5 here, 
the ark of the covenant of God coming into the temple of the Philistines false god what is that picturing for us well that's a picture of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ coming into contact for war with the idolatry of man this is God confronting man's idolatry this is the gospel coming powerfully against us by nature and destroying our idolatry and showing us to be what we are by nature idolaters and so this is a picture for us here of the blessed gospel entering into the ears and the mind and the hearts of the people this is a picture of the gospel being preached and declared this ark coming into the temple of Dagon is the word of God coming right into your heart and, 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 and addressing the idolatry of us by nature. And so I want to highlight a few things that we see in this confrontation between the true and living God and the idolatry of man. Now we're told in verse 1, 1 Samuel 5, 1, and the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. All right, so Ashdod, that's one of the five main cities of the Philistines, Ashdod. And this city means that it's a castle or a fortified city. It's a castle or a fortified city. It's a mighty stronghold of the enemies of God. This is a picture of us by nature, impenetrable by nature. We're fortified by nature. We're a castle, a stronghold by nature. And we're not going to let in our enemy. We're going we're gonna to oppose the true and living God who by nature is our enemy. Right? That's how we see the true and living God as our enemy. But through the wisdom of God, we see how the Lord uses the enemies to bring that gospel right on in there. Right? They're opening themselves up and they're bringing that gospel right on in there, right into the heart of their idolatry. And that's because, by nature, man thinks when he's going to hear the gospel, he thinks, well, that's just like all the other stuff that I've heard in my life. It's just another one of many options or forms of religion. It's just a, another form of idolatry. And so man's open to it. Man's willing to hear it for a time until he's made to hear it in truth, in spirit and in truth. And then, then there's a conflict. Then there's a conflict that, that, that there's a warfare that takes place at that time. And, and man is open to hearing religion. Man doesn't have a problem with religion. It's only the truth that he has a problem with. It's only the truth that he has a problem hearing. And once they hear the truth, if they're the Lord's, they're going to receive it and rejoice in it and be glad and be delivered from their idolatry and grow in Christ and if they're not the Lord's then they're going to harden themselves to it and they're going to run that thing out of there because it's death to them and they're going to get rid of it just like we see the Philistines ultimately do all right so let's see how this confrontation goes verse 2 and 3 when the Philistines took the ark of God they brought it into the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon and when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. And so here it is that when the truth of God comes in to the, to, to, to the ears of the idolater, this is all of us by nature. When, when it comes to our hearts, to our minds, and we hear the truth of the gospel, the idolatry must fall. The idolatry does fall. God takes everything, the false, vain hopes of man, and puts it <coughs> face down in the dirt, which is where we belong. That's what we are before God. We are dust, and we are, our faces are put in the dust before the true and living God. That's what the Lord does by his truth. And so the idols of man fall and they lie before the true and living God. Those things that you hope in by nature, your good works, that you're not so bad, that God is, is, is loving and will just receive you without an atonement being made, without his holy justice being satisfied, that's idolatry. 
Sin must be punished. God is love. But his holiness must be honored, and sin must be punished. That's why we rejoice in Christ, because Christ, he, he took the punishment of God's people in their place and satisfied the holy justice of God for them. But all the false and vain hopes of man, oh, it'll just work out. I'll talk to God when I get up there. He'll understand lies. They're all lies. And when you hear the gospel, the gospel says, no such thing. No, you must be perfect. You must be righteous. And every jot and every tittle must be fulfilled perfectly or else you cannot stand before holy God. And man starts to get uncomfortable. He doesn't like that. And even though we declare the truth of what Christ has accomplished, he still can't hear it or receive it. He still can't hear it or receive it. Now, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 through 5, tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You know, that's the Lord's work that does that in us. There was no man in Dagon's temple that knocked over Dagon before the Ark of the Lord. It, there wouldn't have been any Israelite in there because that was a stronghold of a city, a castle of a city. They weren't going in there. And it wouldn't have been a Philistine that would have done that to their God. This was the Lord who did this. No flesh knocked this, this, this idol over. God did it. And that's what the Lord does with the gospel. He, he knocks over our idols. He, he knocks over all those things that exalt themselves, all of man's flesh that exalts themselves against the true and living God. And so our Lord brings down our idolatry from its lofty place, its ridiculously lofty place, and puts it face down in the dirt. But what does man do? He goes and he props it up, he hears the truth, and he goes there and he picks up his idol, dusts it off, and, 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 and puts it back in its place where it was. Because he still trusts and believes that the false idolatrous things that he believed in. Now if the hearer be a sinner saved by, <coughs> by the grace of God, those false idols will continue to get knocked down until they stay down. The Lord will, will knock down our false views, our vain ideas, and, and he'll go to battle with them through the gospel, through the gospel. Even after we heard the truth, even now, when we hear the truth, we still need the grace of God to take away our idols from believing that it's by something I do that earns and gains the favor of God, or it's something I do that keeps evil away from me and, and gives me the blessings of God. We still have idolatry. We still have things that, that, that come at the truth of God, and it's only through the gospel that those things are knocked down. Knocked down. Now, if the hearer is a self-righteous idolater set in his ways, he'll just keep putting that idol back up. He'll just keep setting it back up until eventually he tires of hearing the gospel and go and drives it from him. He either drives himself away or he drives the truth from him. All right, now verse 4 and 5. And when they arose early on the morrow morning, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon nor any that come into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. And so, as long as the light of the gospel. The salvation of our God continued to shine in that darkness. <coughs> the idols kept falling. And, and man sets it back up, and God knocks it right back down again. And man sets it up, and God knocks it back down again. Because it cannot stand. Our, our lies, our sin, our wickedness, the things we're hoping in, cannot stand before the gospel of our God and Savior. God shows it to be folly, nonsense, foolishness, ignorance, darkness, death. And he shows that over and over again. 
And so they set it up and down went the idol again. And this time the head was removed, the hands were cut off, <clears throat> and all that remained was the stump of Dagon. Now this is exactly what the gospel of our Savior accomplishes in those whom Christ has redeemed with his own blood and brought the power of the gospel to their, to their ears and caused them to hear it by his spirit of grace. First, what does he do? He removes the head of the idol. He takes the head of the idol off. That which we thought was our wisdom and our connection to the true and living God, and we thought, I figured it out. How many times have you thought in your dead religion that you figured it out? And we're finally going to be cured and, and free of your oppression, only to find out you were still in bondage. Still in bondage. Well, the Lord cuts the head off. He crushes the head of the serpent with the foot of Christ, and he delivers us from our oppressor. And what, is, what happens? Christ is made unto us the wisdom of God. He becomes our head. He becomes our wisdom. He becomes our all to us. And second... The works that we were so fearful of when we, when we were in bondage, in religion, running to and fro, let me do this, let me do that better, let me perfect this, and we, we, we ran all around trying to work for our righteousness and try to satisfy our guilty, screaming conscience. And we were working and, and laboring and spending and, and doing everything that we could to improve our status before the true and living God. And so the Lord... He cut these hands off so that we stopped working for our righteousness and stopped trying to work for ourselves to, to gain a righteousness and acceptance with the true and living God. And he gave us peace, peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he put to bed all that, that fear and terror and, 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 and being afraid to die and wondering if we did enough. He put all that to bed in Christ gave us peace through Christ. And Christ of God has made unto us righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Christ is made all to the believer. And what remains in its place? The stump. And we now look and we say, that it was my false religion. And I bowed down to that stump. And I used to worship that stump. And I trusted in that stump. And now I see that's all they are, stumps. They're just idols. A rock there, a piece of wood there, a little bark there. It's all worthless. It's all worthless before the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who, who saved me, who delivered me, gave me life in himself. But if there's no grace, and the hearer be an idolater left to themselves, they'll continue to show more honor to their Dagon. Even though it's all busted up and ruined and, and the gospel has shown that all their works and all their thoughts are wickedness and evil in the sight of God, that he hates it and despises it, he's cast it in the dirt before you, and yet they still trust it, they set up their stump of a God, they pick him up again, they make excuses for why he can't do anything and why it, it's all their fault, and they become even more superstitious. How did these people become more superstitious? Well, once they picked up Dagon and the head was off, and I don't know if they patched it or what they did, but now they wouldn't even step on the threshold of Dagon anymore because his face was there. He had fallen over and fallen apart there. So now they treated it with even more respect, even though God showed it to be more worthless. More worthless. And so that's, it shows the depth of the darkness of man's nature that though he hear the truth, except for the grace of God, the almighty sovereign grace of God, man goes right back like a dog to his vomit and just keeps on lapping it up, thinking that this time it's going to do something better for him. That's what we are by nature. That's why we need the sovereign, almighty presence of God to save us, to be gracious to us, to be kind and merciful, to deliver us in love, to deliver us in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light 
of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And so left to ourselves, we don't discern the folly that we're trusting in. And, and, and I can testify to it for years and years and years and years I spent in vain religion, sometimes getting close and getting nearer and nearer and groping about but never coming to a knowledge of the truth until the Lord brought me totally out of it and brought me completely from it and put me in the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ and him only. You know, Isaiah writes of this in Isaiah 44. He writes of this folly, and he talks about how the sinner goes and cuts down a tree and uses part of that, that, that tree for wood and part of that tree for a carving of a stump of, of his God and some other things, and, and he never thinks about how that's no God. That's all the work of your hands. He said, none considereth in his heart Neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I've burned part of it in the fire. Yea, also I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I have roasted flesh and eaten it. And shall I make the residue thereof an abomination? Shall I fall down to the stock of a tree? He feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul nor say, is there not a lie in my right hand? And that's, that's man by nature. Now, the Lord made it painfully obvious to the Philistines that he was responsible for the call. He was responsible for the pain and the suffering that they were experiencing while they kept the, the Ark of the Covenant there. And they apparently received what's called emeralds, which I believe to be hemorrhoids, and it was painful and embarrassing for them, and that spread to every city. And then in the city of Gath, there was a pestilence, it seems, that killed a lot of them. And then when they thought they would remove the ark and bring it to Ekron, the people cried out, saying, they have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us to slay us and our people. So they knew that it was the Lord doing this. They were convinced that the Lord was, was persecuting them and, and, and torturing them for their unbelief and for keeping the, the ark of God. But for all their ability to recognize that God was inflicting this, this punishment on them, they never bowed before God. They never repented. They never turned from their, their idolatry. They never, never asked God for forgiveness to, to know him. They didn't go to Israel and say, teach us this God. Let us worship this God with you. We'll, we'll be subject to you. Let us know this true and living God. They never sought God for forgiveness according to the truth. They just pushed it out. They got rid of it. They didn't want to hear the truth any longer. And it's like when, when the Lord saved that Gadarene, that Gentile Gadarene, and, and sent the legion into the, swine, the, the herd of swine. When the people went out there and saw that man clothed in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Jesus, what did they ask him? They said, please depart from us. Please go away from us. Leave us. And that's what, what the idolatrous heart does. They want God gone. They want the light and truth of God gone because he keeps putting their idols that they're trusting in face down in the dirt. And he keeps showing that what we trust in by nature is a, is, is a lie. It's foolishness. It's folly. And it cannot save. Paul, writing of this in 2 Corinthians 2, 14, said, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ, in them that are saved and in them that perish. You see, the Lord, by his grace, makes Christ known to sinners, to idolaters. And by his grace, he smashes down our idols, our lies, our falsehoods, our false hopes, and he puts them in the dirt that he may be gracious to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And all who believe him, who come to God in the faith 
of the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting him in his work, that he is our righteousness, the Father receives such and clothes such with the righteousness of Christ and fills their heart with his spirit and his peace and his joy and rejoicing and promises them, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You're mine forever, for I have loved you from the foundation of the world, and I did this for you to bring you to me this very day in my most precious beloved Son, whom I've sent to save you from your sins. God does that. God does that for his people. To the one, this gospel, Paul says, we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And so the sinner saved hears and believes and no longer worships and bows down to that stump. But the, <clears throat> the dead idolater whom God leaves to himself will continue to, will, 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 it's death unto death, and he'll drive that truth from him, drive himself away from it, and keep himself from it so that he cannot hear it and will not hear it and refuse to hear it. But I hope better things of you, my brethren, that the Lord has gathered us together to hear this blessed word and to, to bless us in the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray he make that word profitable and blessed in your hearts. Amen.